Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Shalini Surya Narayan from the Department of Sociology at Hindu College, University of Delhi. Today we are going to discuss about a module, Ivan Illich, from the paper Education and Society. So students, let us see what we are going to learn in this module. This module seeks to elucidate an important viewpoint on education that radically challenges the structure of the modern educational system. Let's take a look at the biographical sketch of Ivan Illich. Austrian philosopher Ivan Illich was born in Vienna on 4th September 1926. His father was Croatian and a Catholic, hailing from an aristocratic family. His mother was Jewish. Due to his variegated ancestry, Illich has Italian, Spanish, French, and German as his native languages. He majored in chemistry at the University of Florence in Italy. He then studied theology and philosophy at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome from 1942 to 1946 and medieval history at Salzburg. Illich graduated from the University of Salzburg with a PhD in history. His doctoral dissertation was on the well-known historian Arnold Toynbee. He prepared for his priesthood at the Gregorian University in Rome and was ordained in 1951. Illich became a Roman Catholic priest and was priest at a parish in one of New York's poorest neighborhoods, Washington Heights. In 1956, at the young age of 30, Illich was appointed vice rector of the Catholic University of Puerto Rico. Being a part of the religious order gave Illich the opportunity to observe closely its organization and functioning. He started developing critical opinion on the church and its decrees. In the north of Manhattan, which was then home to impoverished immigrants from Puerto Rico. It was during his tenure at Puerto Rico that Illich started expressing criticism of the Vatican's assertions on social issues such as birth control. It was also at the Catholic University of Puerto Rico that Illich met education theorist Everett Reimer, who was a proponent of de-schooling and had authored several books on educational policy. A well-known work by Reimer is School is Dead, Alternatives in Education. Well, the two became good friends and this association laid the foundation for Illich's ideas on education. Illich turned a vociferous critic of the form that contemporary Western institutions had taken, especially those related to education, medicine, work, energy use, transportation, and economic development. In 1961, Illich founded the Centro Intercultural de Documentation, or the CIDOC, which was the Intercultural Documentation Center at Cuernavaca in Mexico, which was ostensibly a research center offering language courses to missionaries from North America and volunteers of the Alliance for Progress program, initiated by the American President John F. Kennedy. Illich's intent, however, was to utilize that opportunity to examine the role of the Vatican in the so-called modern development of the Third World. Illich was skeptical of those emissaries and viewed such interventions as a form of hegemony and as such an act of what he called war on subsistence. He felt that missionaries deputed by the church ought not to impose their own cultural values on the host cultures. Throughout the late 60s and the early 70s, the CIDOC functioned both as a language school as well as a forum for free-thinking intellectuals across America. After 10 years of persistent criticism of the institutional actions of the church, the CIDOC was an organization that came into the gaze of the Vatican as a conflicting agency. Illich was called to Rome for questioning. Illich then resigned from active priesthood in the late 1960s, but continued to be perceived as a priest and occasionally conducted private masses. In 1976, eventually the center was also shut down due to a host of factors 
with consent from some of the other members of the CIDOC. Some of the members subsequently continued language schools in Kirnavaka. Ivan Illich In the 1970s, Illich gained popularity among leftist intellectuals in France, his thesis on the popular historian Arnold Toynbee having been rather well received. From the 1980s onwards, Illich travelled in America and Europe, mainly dividing his time between the United States, Mexico and Germany. He was appointed visiting professor of philosophy, science, technology and society at Penn State University in the USA. He also taught at the University of Bremen and the University of Hagen in Germany. Illich's Pedagogy Ivan Illich became well known in the 1970s when his de-schooling society was published. The work basically argued that the top-down management of schools renders students powerless. Illich observed that this top-down management is a syndrome that is typical of the modern technological economy and all its institutions, and in the specific context of education, it is this that prevents people from real learning. His tools for conviviality made similar criticism of technology in general. His work, Energy and Equity, have also made Ivan Illich one of the most important theorists of the radical ecology movement of the 1970s. Since the thrust of this e-lesson is on education, in the following section, you will be explained what is the main argument enshrined in de-schooling society. You are, however, encouraged to look up web resources and read other works by Illich in order to enrich your perspective and gain deeper insight into the thought of Ivan Illich. An Overview of Ivan Illich's De-Schooling Society The book that brought Ivan Illich to public attention was De-Schooling Society, a radical critical discourse on education as practiced in modern economies. This text is available on the web as a free download. The following section takes a journey of this classic text in order to acquaint you with an important anti-view on educational institutions. In his work, De-Schooling Society, at the onset, Illich begins by elaborating what, according to him, education ought to be. Illich contends that education is meant to be primarily a liberating experience. This is indeed true. One expects education to liberate oneself from darkness and bondage of ignorance. According to Illich, education should provide the opportunity for an individual to explore one's potential and use initiative and judgment to develop one's faculties and talents to the fullest. Or alternately, at the very basic, education is to do with the learning of specific skills, such as a language or a craft. Whether education is to do with the acquisition of specific skills or with its more lofty ideals, in either case, according to Illich, schools as they exist and function are ill-equipped to achieve these goals. The existing format of school education itself is self-defeating in nature. Illich argues that those who routinely use certain skills in their daily lives would be by far the best persons to teach those skills. He gives the example of Spanish-speaking teenagers in New York, many of whom would drop out who were engaged to teach Spanish to school teachers, social workers, and ministers. They were trained to use a teaching manual designed for use by linguists with university qualifications. And within just one week, their training was completed. Once on the field, within six months, they had effectively accomplished their task of teaching Spanish to non-Spaniards. However, in actual practice, we function within a system where such natural skills are not given due recognition or put to good use. More often than not, such natively skilled persons do not have the official endorsement to impart their skills within the ambit of a formal system. The educational system demands that only persons with standardized credentials, those persons who are officially trained and possess certain qualifications, are certified to be teachers and be allowed to teach. This is the case 
with all manners of skill training. Further, real learning also implies involvement of the student in every aspect of the learning process. According to Illich, most learning actually requires no teaching. In the present educational system, students have little say in the decision-making with regard to their own education. Their involvement is limited to compliance with the norms and standards. Expressing disappointment at this restrictive nature of institutionalized education, Illich makes a case for self-directed education, supported by volitional social relationships and conducted through fluid, informal arrangements. Illich, therefore, sees schools as repressive institutions that stifle creative expression, instill conformity, and crush pupils into accepting the interests of the powerful and regarding these to be just. This, to Illich, is the hidden curriculum operating in schools. The student has no control over what he learns and how he learns it. The teaching regime is an authoritarian one, and in order to be regarded successful, the student must learn to comply and conform. The best student is not necessarily the most learned or skilled or the most exceptionally brilliant. The best student is one who can perform best within the system. Those who excel at conforming are selected for the next level and are suitably rewarded. Illich feels that more than imparting skills and competence, schools teach and reinforce a worldview that equates teaching with learning, great advancement with education, and a diploma with competence. Since the school is the agency that grants the seal of credentials that have acceptance in the labor market, it carries with it an immense coercive power to exact conformity. Graduating from such schools, students as citizens continue to use the same yardstick through their life in all walks of their lives. Illich has a rather pessimistic assertion, which I quote, universal education through schooling is not feasible. It would be no more feasible if it were attempted by means of alternative institutions built on the style of present schools, neither new attitudes of teachers towards their pupils, nor the proliferation of educational hardware or software, nor finally the attempt to expand the pedagogue's responsibility until it engulfs his pupils' lifetimes will deliver universal education. The current search for new educational funnels must be reversed into the search for the institutional inverse, educational webs, which heighten the opportunity for each one to transform each moment of his living into one of learning, sharing, and caring. We hope to contribute concepts needed by those who conduct such counterfoil research on education, and also to those who seek alternatives to other established service industries. Unquote. The above passage has been quoted as in a sense it carries the crux of Illich's argument on schooling. The last sentence makes clear what the title suggests, that the institutionalization of education gives impetus to the institutionalization of society, a condition that Illich strongly abhors. To surmount the problem of an over-institutionalized society, Illich feels the base has to be dismantled. The bottom line for him, thus is the deinstitutionalizing of education for a deinstitutionalized society. Illich thus views the educational system as the basis of the problem with modern industrial society. Schools as the primary agency of socialization become the first and most crucial stage in nurturing mindless, what he calls mindless, conforming, and easily manipulated citizens. In schools, pupils are taught to conform, and that conformity is rewarded. Individuality and originality are not given due respect. You may have observed, for instance, in your own career as a student, that most institutions have standardized syllabi and examination patterns. Certain texts have to be consulted, and answers have to be written according to preset norms. 
attendance and other behavior regulations have also to be complied with. While these are necessary for the survival of the institution and to maintain order in society, no one can deny that such strictures tend to curb innovativeness and do stifle creativity. As an individual, a student learns deference to authority, gets lulled into regarding a certain amount of alienation as a natural state of being, and learns to consume and value the services of the institution and thereby to forget how to think for oneself. There is commodification of education. Education in the prescribed format is socially rewarded and hence becomes a coveted object of consumption to be devoured in ever-increasing quantities. For Illich, these lessons at school prepare the individual for his role as a mindless consumer to whom the passive consumption of goods and services of industrial society becomes an end in itself. Illich is also scathing in his attack of the role of advertising. Advertisements lure the consumer and give impetus to the ideology of accumulation. Responding to advertisements and the directives of those in power, people expand their resources that include time, money and energy in obtaining these much-touted objects of desire, the products of industry. It must be noted that when Illich talks of commodities, he means both goods and services including the services of professionals such as doctors, lawyers, and even social workers. Indeed, Illich is skeptical of all of these people. People are schooled through the educational system to believe that they need the services of these professionals from time to time through their lives. They are taught to show deference and respect for the authority of professionals and become devoted consumers of the services of doctors, social workers, lawyers, etc. Through this indoctrination by the educational system, they are trained to accept that those in authority know what is best for them and can decide about their well-being even better than they themselves. People develop dependency on the directives of the state and its arm, the bureaucracy, and various professional bodies. Illich argues that the modern industrial society in its current manner of functioning is ill-equipped to lay the edifice of true happiness and fulfillment in life. He points out that in spite of the immense availability of commodities off the market and the purchasing power to acquire these, people remain dissatisfied. Illich laments the fact that even as trained professionals are incessantly deployed with ever more comprehensive programs to solve social ills, misery, dissatisfaction, and social problems continue to increase alarmingly. The consumer-driven society has only one stock solution for all that ails it, the consumption of more and more goods and services. The following passages quoted from Deschooling Society will give you another sense of what Illich is trying to say and help bring out the rationale of Illich's argument to make you perceive of Illich's ideas with more empathy. I quote, If we do not challenge the assumption that valuable knowledge is a commodity which under certain circumstances may be forced into the consumer, society will be increasingly dominated by sinister pseudo-schools and totalitarian managers of information. Pedagogical therapists will drug their pupils more in order to teach them better and students will drug themselves more to gain relief from the pressures of teachers and the race for certificates. Increasingly larger numbers of bureaucrats will presume to pose as teachers. The language of the schoolmen has already been co-opted by the ad man. Now the general and the policeman try to dignify their professions by masquerading as educators. In a schooled society, war-making and civil repression find an educational rationale. Pedagogical warfare in the style of Vietnam will be increasingly justified as the only way of teaching people the superior value of unending progress. Repression will be seen as a missionary effort to hasten the coming of the mechanical messiah. More and more countries 
will resort to the pedagogical torture already implemented in Brazil and Greece. This pedagogical torture is not used to extract information or to satisfy the psychic needs of sadists. It relies on random terror to break the integrity of an entire population and make it plastic material for the teachings invented by technocrats. The totally destructive and constantly progressive nature of obligatory instruction will fulfill its ultimate logic unless we begin to liberate ourselves right now from our pedagogical hubris, our belief that man can do what God cannot, namely manipulate others for their own salvation. Many people are just awakening to the inexorable destruction which present production tends imply for the environment. But individuals have only very limited power to change these trends. The manipulation of men and women begun in school has also reached a point of no return, and most people are still unaware of it. They still encourage school reform, as Henry Ford II proposes, less poisonous automobiles. Daniel Bell says our epoch is characterized by an extreme disjunction between cultural and social structures, the one being devoted to apocalyptic attitudes, the other to technocratic decision-making. This is certainly true for many educational reformers who feel impelled to condemn almost everything which characterizes modern schools and at the same time propose new schools. In his structure of scientific revolutions, Thomas Kuhn argues that such dissonance inevitably precedes the emergence of a new cognitive paradigm. The facts reported by those who observed free fall, by those who returned from the other side of the earth, and by those who used the new telescope, did not fit the Ptolemaic worldview. Quite suddenly, the Newtonian paradigm was accepted. The dissonance which characterizes many of the young today is not so much cognitive as a matter of attitudes, a feeling about what a tolerable society cannot be like. What is surprising about this dissonance is the ability of a very large number of people to tolerate it. The capacity to pursue incongruous goals requires an explanation. According to Max Gluckman, all societies have procedures to hide such dissonances from their members. He suggests that this is the purpose of ritual. Rituals can hide from their participants even discrepancies and conflicts between social principle and social organization. As long as an individual is not explicitly conscious of the ritual character of the process through which he was initiated to the forces which shape his cosmos, he cannot break the spell and shape a new cosmos. As long as we are not aware of the ritual through which school shapes the progressive consumer, the economy's major resource, we cannot break the spell of this economy and shape a new one. Illich's disenchantment with contemporary capitalist society is thus complete and abiding. Like Marx, Illich also links the hegemony of the schools to the demands and requirements of the economic system. He is unequivocal in his contempt for and condemnation of the consumer-driven society. Though he does not overtly employ categories such as superstructure and infrastructure, the domain of ritual for Illich, also as in Marxist thinking, plays the same opiate-like role, taking away from the dissonance between how things are and what they should have been like. However, unlike Karl Marx, Ivan Illich does not relate the exploitative character of the modern economic system to the internal structure of the capitalist regime. His training in theology leads him to conceive of this as the result of the hubris of man, born out of the success attained in the realm of technology. A hedonistic elation at such manifest conquests of nature by technology that make man feel that he has gained control over nature. For Illich, it is this very hubris, the extreme pride or self-confidence, that makes man scoff nature and verily the gods themselves a hubris that must inevitably lead to nemesis itself. 
This is what fundamentally distinguishes Illich from Marx. There is a certain cynicism in the thought of Illich, bred out of his own disillusioning experiences with institutions. This disdain for institutions that is visible through much of Illich's writing is completely different from Marx's naive optimism. Marx's belief in the doctrines of the Enlightenment gave a basis for the idea of progress from one social order to a better one, in spite of the struggle and conflict that such processes go through each stage would entail. Being close to institutional religion has perhaps taken away from Illich this innate faith in the goodness of human nature that Marx had. He also differs from Marx in the place according to the educational system in the larger social structure. For Marx, it is the economy that constitutes the base of the social order. For Illich, it is education that constitutes the base of society, and it is that which needs to be overhauled in order to effect significant changes in economy and society. Viewed that way, Illich's argument can be considered inverse of the one put forth by Marx. Illich's contention is that schools reproduce society and therefore lie at the very base of all social institutions and are the root of all social ills. Eradication of schools would therefore be the logical first step in eliminating the general malaise that exists in society. Illich's suggestion for the abolition of schooling altogether is the result of this belief in the primacy of the educational institution and at the same time his estrangement with it and hence cannot translate itself into a practical agenda for action even though Illich does come up with solutions for the problems that plague modern education. Now what is the solution? The solution according to Illich is as follows. Through all the disillusionment, Illich does propose his solution for the problem of modern education. His solution is misleadingly simple, yet a radical one. The answer for Illich lies in the abolition of schools and the educational system as it exists. Hence the title, De-Schooling Society. As the school is the foundational institution, de-schooling is the first logical step towards reform. I quote Illich, de-schooling is therefore at the root of any movement for human liberation. Illich suggests the use of what he calls skill exchanges and learning webs to replace the conventional school. In the former, an instructor teaches a skill he has to others who are seeking it. For instance, a Spanish-speaking person can teach Spanish to all those who need to learn. Now, according to Illich, skill teaching is a matter of repeating drills over and over and over. Illich recognizes that acquiring a skill need not always be an invigorating experience. In fact, it is all the more dreary for those pupils who need it the most. Further, Illich recognizes the need for some form of certification or credit system, but is unable to provide a sustainable alternative. The other mechanism suggested by Illich is the more comprehensive method of creation of learning webs. This is the educational method of choice for Illich. Learning webs create a network of teaching and learning among like-minded people and shall proceed on the basis of creative and exploratory learning through their own initiative. Illich has elucidated how these webs may be constituted through reference services to educational objects which facilitate access to things or processes used for formal learning. Some of these things can be reserved for this purpose stored in libraries, rental agencies, laboratories and showrooms like museums and theatres. Others can be in daily use in factories, airports or on farms but made available to students as apprentices on an on-off hours. Skill exchanges wherein people are enabled to list their skills, the conditions under which they are willing to serve as models for others who want to learn these skills, and the addresses at which they can be reached. Peer matching, a communications network which permits persons to describe the learning activity in which they wish to engage in the hope of finding a partner for the inquiry and reference services to educators at large who can be listed in a directory giving the addresses and self-descriptions of professionals 
paraprofessionals and freelancers along with conditions of access to their services. Illich also advocates the use of technology, computers included, for the purpose of learning webs. According to Illich, a user could identify himself by name and address and describe the activity for which he sought a peer. A computer would send him back the names and addresses of all those who had entered the same description. He feels that this is a simple utility that can be used on a broad scale for the publicly valued activity of learning. Illich has concluded that de-schooling will destroy the reproductive organs of a consumer society and lead to the creation of a social order where an individual can be truly liberated and fulfilled. De-schooling society and evaluation. The work de-schooling society is not only a critique, it also contains alternative suggestions for restructuring the mode of teaching and learning throughout society. Through this book, De-schooling society, Illich has made a rather compelling argument for the abolition of schools. Tempting though that may appear, the solution suggested by Illich clearly border the utopian. His solution is not so simple as it looks. It is naive and simplistic. Similar suggestions have been put forth in the context of other social institutions like the family and the state. However, whether one subscribes to the functionalist viewpoint or not, one has to willy-nilly acknowledge the need for some basic institutions in society, which have therefore collectively been referred to as prerequisites. If schools were to be done away with, whatever alternative form would take over the function of schools would also in time undoubtedly acquire a labyrinthic institutional structure and may even defeat the very purpose for which it was created. It has been observed, for instance, in the case of charismatic authority, that the routinization of charisma leads to the creation of organizational structures which override the very heart and soul of the entity. Illich's criticism of the church itself is an illustration of the overpowering presence of the institutional aspect of charisma. Free-flowing educational webs, such as those Illich suggests, if have to last beyond a generation and continue to sustain themselves, need necessarily to develop self-perpetuating institutional structures. Hence, doing away with schools would inevitably lead to their replacement with other structures, with a plethora of possible latent and unintended consequences that are likely to ensue, not all of which may be useful or functional. The nitty-gritty of the alternative system suggested by Illich is also problematic. According to Illich, the operation of a peer matching network would be simple and one cannot fault that logic. Though the concept of learning webs is a useful one, and as such these networks can function and do function parallel to regular schooling as a supplementary mechanism, learning webs by themselves can by no means offer alternatives to schooling. There has to be some system of standardization and ratification of the output of education. It is also quite curious that Illich calls for the use of advanced technology to support learning webs, given his well-documented mistrust of technology. It is somewhat paradoxical that Illich should invoke the very technology that he has so consistently and vehemently derided to run his learning webs. Concerns could be raised about the ideas of Illich vis-a-vis -vis private schooling. However, Illich should not be misinterpreted as a proponent of privatization of education. When he talks of informal, close-knit teaching-learning groups, he genuinely means that people get together through their own motivation rather than coercion to teach and learn. He's not spearheading the cause for a free market economy in the domain of education. It must be noted that Illich's opposition was not merely to state-run schooling, but to schooling as such. Therefore, his call for the de-establishment of schools is not to be taken as a call for private schooling and educational services, but rather for the creation of a schoolless society. 
If Illich appears to lean towards free market in education, he made it clear that such was only meant as a starting point towards achieving de-schooling and not as the ultimate goal of the educational enterprise. In fact, Illich actually opposed advocates of free market education and felt that they could be what he called the most dangerous category of educational reformers. The other serious methodological concern is to do with the notion that the ills of the economic order can be remedied by revamping the educational system. This is not a realistic premise. As Marxist sociologists Samuel Bowles and Herbert Gintis have pointed out, Illich has made a fundamental error of reasoning. As pointed out earlier, Illich has seen the situation in its inverse. Rather than seeing schools as the basis of the problem and their removal as a solution, Bowles and Gintis argue that the real problem lies in the modern capitalist economic system. The social problems to which these reforms are addressed have their roots not primarily in the school system itself, but rather in the normal functioning of the economic system. According to them, de-schooling would only produce occupational misfits and job blues which by themselves cannot lead to social transformation. In the ultimate analysis, from their perspective, liberation can result only from a revolutionary change in the economic infrastructure of society. So students, let us summarize what we have learned in this module. Illich's thesis on de-schooling is thought-provoking and even provocative, but it does not suggest a cogent, workable agenda of action. There is no mechanism in Illich's schema through which the anarchy created by the absence of schools can be redeemed. At the same time, no one can deny the fact that Illich has drawn compelling attention to the overpowering, self-defeating character of the modern educational system. His solution may not be workable, but we have to acknowledge that there is a problem. And for that effort, at least Ivan Illich must be resoundingly applauded. Thank you.